Good evening. Our guest today is uh, New Hampshire Executive Counselor and 2020 Democratic candidate for Governor Andrew Valinsky. I'll share a little bit of information about Andrew, a bit of his story, and he'll uh, fill in the rest. And he's been kind enough to answer questions. Um, full disclosure, I'm a supporter. I'm a contributor. So uh, he's, uh, he's one of my political heroes. Uh, Andrew grew up in a town reminiscent of New Hampshire's declining mill towns with struggling schools. His father was a trade union member who worked as a mechanic and maintenance man. He was the only one in his family to attend and graduate from college and put himself through law school by working as a carpenter. It's a good skill to have. It is. For nearly four decades, Andrew and his wife Amy have made New Hampshire home and raised their three children here. Andrew has served on New Hampshire's Executive Council since 2016. So Andrew, can you tell us a little more about yourself and what made you decide to run for governor, please? Yeah, well, as um, many people know, I was the Claremont lawyer. Um, I organized the team of volunteer lawyers who exposed just how unfairly our schools are funded and how the quality of a child's education depends on where she lives. Uh, and we did more than expose it. We convinced the Supreme Court for the first time in New Hampshire's history in 1993 to recognize a constitutional right to a state-funded public education. That was a bold idea. Uh, but for lack of courageous leadership, we've never fulfilled the promise of Claremont. And so you've read a little bit about my biography. Educational opportunity has meant the world to me. Um, it got me out of that mill town where the mill failed. Um, and so not having been able to fully realize the promise of Claremont is really what drives me. Um, we need to do a lot better for our school children. We need to be more fair to our taxpayers. We need to have seniors not be so worried about losing their homes to the property tax. We need to make it so younger families and working families can buy their homes. Um, you know, the, everyone, I assume we'll talk about this later, everyone talks about the pledge and, and we can't ever change the property tax system. That's the Republican storyline. The property tax is New Hampshire's broad-based tax. Let's be clear about that. If you own a home or a business, you pay the property tax directly. If you're a renter, you pay it indirectly through your rent. We all pay it. You can't get much broader than that. And my campaign uh, refuses uh, to take the pledge. I will never take the pledge. The pledge is a promise to fail. And so we've introduced our own pledge. And that pledge is to reduce the property tax for the majority of New Hampshire citizens. That's why I'm running for governor. As a retired high school science teacher, it, it boggles my mind that it's taking this long to do it. But I know this is New Hampshire, you know, and the New Hampshire way is slow. Maybe steady, maybe not. But uh, thank you for the work you do on that, on that uh, front. It's well, critical. I, it's not just New Hampshire. I, I actually am in the middle of reading Samantha Power's book. Uh, and in part of it, she talks about uh, living in Atlanta and going to a high school that was desegregating uh -huh. 30 years after all of the Supreme Court orders came down. Uh -huh. So our 30 year trajectory, it's time to do what needs to be done to move New Hampshire forward. Yeah. Tell me, uh, where did you get your passion for community service? You know, I think it comes from a lot of places. Um, but a lot of it is my understanding of how lucky I am. Uh, I am the only one in my family to go to college. Um, I have three siblings um, who work really hard, blue collar jobs, struggle all their lives. Um, my friends from high school, uh, when the mill closed, their families lost their jobs. I saw that. I expressly went to law school to gain the kind of skills I thought I would need to make a difference. That's why I went. And uh, it's had some great benefits. So I uh, actually met my wife, Amy, in a student-led poverty law clinic in DC when we were both in law school. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. We went to different schools. She's a lot smarter than me. Uh, she went to Georgetown, I went to GW, but we met in a common citywide clinic uh, and then moved to Tennessee soon after law school, combined all of our debt, and she became a legal aid lawyer and I became a public defender and a law school teacher. Um, it's always been there. Um, even in private practice, I've led all of my law firms in my commitment to doing what's called pro bono work, volunteer work right. as a lawyer. I've developed the skills to make a difference, and I'm going to make that difference. Um, I can relate. I, I was the only one in my f broader family to go to college, so it's, uh, Are it's you there. Ringing? I did tone this down, but I don't know why it's ringing through. <clears throat> uh, New Hampshire's school reopening plan was released about a week and a half ago and it was received with mixed reactions. What stands out to you about <clears throat> the school reopening plan and what would you have done differently if you were governor? Well, first, it's not a plan. Uh, and there are no resources behind it. It is Frank Adelblue and Chris Sununu following the lead of Trump, Pence, and Betsy DeVos. That's what this is. It's a complete abdication of leadership on their part. Let me tell you, there about 10 points in my reopening plan. Let me just tick through them quickly. First, kids need to wear masks when they leave home, uh, as young as they possibly can. It won't be perfect. They'll take them on, they'll take them off. Uh, in some instances, we may want to use plastic shields uh, instead of cloth masks, because uh, they may work better, uh, but mask up. Second, we need to reduce the density on school buses. Um, to the extent parents can take their kids to school, walk them or drive them, that'll be a help. To the extent we need to add additional bus routes, we need to do that. Next, we need to reduce the classroom density. That means staggering uh, attendance, a couple of days on, a couple of days off, morning session versus afternoon session. We can do either or both uh, and still maintain remote learning for children and families that prefer that. Uh, next, we need to teach out of doors as much as possible um, because the transmission of COVID is less likely if you're outdoors. Uh, next, and here's a point where the governor's plan is so terrible. Um, there's an engineering standard for how often the air should turn over in a classroom. It's two and a half times an hour. It's a recognized standard. The governor's plan says, quote, evaluate your HVAC system end quote. I've been in many of New Hampshire's 488 schools. Many are more than 50 years old. There are plenty of classrooms that aren't going to meet that standard, and we should not put children and personnel in those classrooms. So we need to test, and then we need to upgrade. And then I think what's going to happen is by late October, early November, uh, we're going to need to go back to remote learning in most parts of the state. Uh, COVID will be flaring again. Uh, we'll be in too cold and flu season. You won't be able to tell the difference of what's happening. Uh, and we should, should use the first five or six weeks for social emotional learning and getting ready for the kids to go remote again, not in an emergency, crazy, build the plane as you're flying it approach, but in a careful planned way. And then the last part of my plan is we need to presume that when school personnel get sick with COVID, that it's related to their job. Um, for workers' comp purposes, firefighters have a presumption that if they get ill while they're actively working as firefighters, it's job related. If they get lung cancer, same presumption needs to apply for teachers and other school, school personnel. I think it's really important to take care of of the folks that are taking care of our children. Uh, so those are my real straightforward minimum standards, coordinate the effort. Uh, the governor's plan has done none of that. I hear a <clears throat> familiar theme that relates to the national level uh, about testing and uh, tracing here, testing and sort of evaluating, maybe, maybe not. So maybe that's coming well, straight down. Well, our testing is so deficient. <clears throat> Yeah. Um, you know, we, Amy and I are new grandparents. Uh, we have a nine-week-old grandson. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, in Denver, though. <laughs> so I've never held 
my grandson. Yeah. Uh, Amy and one of our daughters drove out earlier this week to Denver, oh. uh, and they got tested before they went just to sure. be cautious. Yeah. It took them eight days to get results. By the time they got the results, they needed to be tested again. It, it's, you can't do contact tracing, which is how you fight community spread viruses if it takes eight days to get a result. Yeah. That's a real failure. Going along on that theme of comparing yourself to uh, Chris Sanu, um, how do you think he's handled the state response to the coronavirus and uh, what actions would you take? Um, Sununu's been too little too late. Um, and particularly in the area of schools, he's abdicated his responsibility to Trump and Pence. Um, there happened to be a council meeting, our last in-person governor and council meeting on March 11th. Uh, Sununu walked into the meeting and told us he'd just been on the phone with Pence and that COVID was going to be like the flu and there was no need to close the schools. And he and I argued about this uh, at the start of the meeting. Um, to the point where I wound up dictating to his lawyer, the governor needs to know what his emergency powers are. You need to research these issues so you're ready. Of course, he declared the emergency that Friday. Yeah. Uh, so he needs to stop listening to Trump and Pence and do his job here. That would be a huge difference between he and I, number one. Public health data and science would drive my decision making. Uh, at the beginning of April, um, I confronted him on us uh, not having an order that requires the wearing of masks or facial coverings in indoor spaces. Uh, he said public health data doesn't support that. Uh, that's not true. Uh, there is good, solid support that if four out of five people wear masks in indoor spaces or in tight outdoor spaces, it makes a huge difference. Um, you can do some things with social distancing, which is what we're doing here, uh, with low density. Um, but if you're shopping in the supermarket, there is no excuse to fail to wear a mask. Yeah. Yeah. You've been uh, long and rightly connected to the fight for uh, fair and equitable, equitable uh, education funding. So what led you to that fight, to fight so hard and so long for that and for New Hampshire's communities and, uh, and mostly with no compensation at all? What, what yeah. got you into that? It wasn't for the money, <laughs> that's for sure. Um, you know, some of it's my own personal experience. Um, when I first went to Claremont to meet the clients, it was like going home. Yeah. Um, Claremont was a textile mill town where I grew up was a steel mill town, but in both places the mills failed and people lost their jobs. And I saw a lot of the same things in Claremont that, um, that I grew up with. I went to a very challenged, struggling high school. Um, very few kids um, went to college. Um, I was an exception, a huge dropout. Even the ones who completed really weren't well served by their high school education. Uh, we also had the additional problems of racial difficulties in my high school. Um, I avoided those because I, I happened to play football, so I knew uh, and hung out with all the black kids, and it wasn't a problem for me. Um, but it just, I know the difference it's made in my life. Um, and I, I really do want every child in New Hampshire to have a shot at the opportunities that having a good education brings you. And then, and then at some level, it's about economic justice. So there's real clear data that if you drop out of high school, your lifetime earnings will be at one level. If you complete high school, it'll be millions more. If you complete college, it'll be millions more again over your lifetime. Why should we consign children at an early age to failure economically? Uh, this really is a justice issue for me, uh, and I have some very strong feelings about it. And I have very strong feelings about the politicians who time after time after time either look the, way, the other way or mischaracterize how successful they were in addressing the problem. 
you know, I'm in a governor's race now. My opponent says he can solve the problem by closing loopholes in existing tax laws. Well, good governors, Maggie Hassan, John Lynch, Gene Shaheen, have tried that approach. And there isn't enough loose change in the couch cushions. We need to have an adult discussion about how we finance and invest in important services in New Hampshire, education foremost, but roads and bridges, mental health, all of that suffers because we won't have an honest conversation about New Hampshire's revenue system, and the time is finally now to do it. COVID's made the problem even more acute, um, and so let's have that conversation. This pandemic has really laid bare the very drastic problems with our society as it's been run historically. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> about uh, maybe four or five months ago, I videotaped one of your Education Funding 101 sessions in uh, what town was that? Stratford, Stratford at the library. Town, Stratford Library, right. My old friend Bob Perry was there. Um, yes. And so I learned at that session, uh, and I have that on you, my YouTube video channel, um, you, you brought up some issue called stabilization funding. So can you share that legislative fight over the three-year loss of stabilization funding and then the final restoration of that to assist poor communities, property poor communities, and what Governor Sununa's response was? Yeah, so this is a current problem, too, uh, that we need to be aware of. Um, prior governors, prior Republican leadership, particularly in the House, has balanced the New Hampshire budget on the backs of local property taxpayers by shifting more and more responsibilities to pay for education to the local community when it's a state responsibility. And one of the ways they did that is by cutting what was called stabilization funding. This is Speaker O'Brien's brain trial. Brain, uh, brain, brain, <laughs> Speaker O'Brien's idea, um, he wanted to phase out stabilization money at the rate of 4% a year. Doesn't sound like a lot. To a community like Berlin, that meant their tax rate went up 55 cents every year just to stay unfairly funded to make up for the 300 odd thousand dollar loss. Um, and they were cutting it and cutting it and cutting it uh, it was so bad that my friend and colleague from the school funding lawsuit days, John Tobin, was organizing a new lawsuit. Um, and I can't be involved in suing the state anymore because I am the state. Uh, and so some people reached out to me, what's involved in a lawsuit? How does school funding work? And in June of 18, uh, John and I agreed to do a forum in Pittsfield uh, just to explain everything. Roadshow. Yeah, and um, more than 125 people showed up uh, on this hot June night. We explained it, and one of the key places was this stabilization loss. Mm -hmm. uh, John and I and Doug Hall, a number of others now, uh, have gone on to do more than 70 forums, like the one you attended in Stratford. People can understand what's happening. They don't like it. We created a consensus to stop the cuts and to restore the last three years of stabilization cuts to communities that really needed it. Chris Sununu opposed it, Dan Feltis opposed it, and then they went out and started taking credit. Sununu went around with these big oversized checks, if you remember, uh, to communities. That was because of the community forums that John, Doug, and I did all across the state from Keene to Rochester, Nashua to Berlin. We had 160 people turn out in Berlin for the forum. Wow. Uh, that was September of 18. Yeah. Um, these have been really good exchanges. And we listen as much as we teach mm -hmm. in these forums. And some of the stories are just heartbreaking. Pittsfield doesn't have foreign language teachers. Berlin doesn't have a, a chemistry teacher. Close their last elementary school, move the little kids to the middle school and the middle school up, uh, this shouldn't be happening in our state. No. We're fifth in the nation in per capita income. We, we have some resources. We're just denying them to the most needy in our community, our, our children. 
Pittsfield was my second teaching career, so I'm very familiar with uh, their, their situation. And I have good feelings about the people there. And so oh, forth. it's a wonderful place. Uh, the current superintendent's John Freeman. Yep. It's a wonderful guy doing great stuff. You're generally considered to be a much more environmentally friendly candidate for governor than any candidate in recent history that I can recall. Why are environmental issues important to you? What actions will you take on behalf of environmental issues as governor to protect the public health of Granite Staters while keeping the health of jobs and the economy in mind? Yeah. Um, this is part of being a father and a grandfather. I, I worry about the future I'm leaving for our children and our children's children. Uh, and I stay informed. Uh, so I know the science tells us we have eight or 10 years to bend the curve on carbon. Um, so the idea that you can make excuses to build one more fracked gas pipeline makes no sense to me. Uh, that's a $400 million step in the wrong direction. Uh, Granite Bridge Pipeline, which Liberty Utilities would like to build in this part of the state, is a huge mistake. It's dangerous to the environment and would cost ratepayers uh, for 20 or 30 years. Um, so the first thing I think we need to do is stop the bad stuff. Stop the building of pipelines, just like uh, Keystone and Dakota and Atlantic Coast, Granite Bridge needs to leave. And we need to bring that fight to a conclusion in the next couple of months. Um, so I start there, stop the bad stuff. Yeah. I then think we need to combine with our neighbors to build a regional Green New Deal that will create jobs. Uh, New Hampshire is last in the region for solar jobs. That's because we have less renewable energy than any other state in New England. To give you an idea, New Hampshire gets 1% of its power from solar energy. Vermont gets 12%. And there are more solar jobs in Vermont as a result. Right. Uh, we have had really strong machining and manufacturing industries in New Hampshire, uh, particularly in, in the Claremont area um, and other parts of the state. We need to revive those uh, and use those for wind and solar uh, applications. Um, and then we need to get the state's house in order. So within the first 30 days uh, of my taking office, if I'm so lucky, I would create the Agency for Climate, Energy, and the Environment. And its job would be to create a citizen-informed plan to bring New Hampshire state government to carbon neutral by 2030. And that's more than just the cars and trucks. We need to be looking at our school buildings, many of which, as I've mentioned, are 40 and 50 years old and are going to need to be refurbished or replaced. We should do that with energy conservation in mind, and we should put solar panels on the roofs of every building we can do that with. So those are the starting points for me. Uh, it is a really high priority. I don't take fossil fuel money. I've never taken a Liberty Utilities check. Uh, my Democratic opponent and the governor both take fossil fuel money. Chris Sinun has made uh, an art of it. Yeah. You may know that I've been involved in Seacoast Anti-Pollution League since 1972. Yes. And Seacoast Anti-Pollution League, otherwise known as SAPL, has uh, been focusing on offshore wind for the last 15 years. Doug Bogan's been leading that for SAPL. Sure. Um, <clears throat> We, we approached the governor repeatedly with letters and with appeals. We met with both John Lynch and Jean Shaheen. Um, we couldn't get them to move on the, uh, the task force, the offshore wind task force. The, the, yeah, uh, the federal one. The federal one. And uh, finally, 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 I stood up at a meeting with um, mostly heads of uh, secondary education community colleges and others, there was a whole forum on jobs. And so I told the governor, he was present there, I said, you know, you're missing out on the opportunity to have a, a lead in this new industry by not supporting this effort. It took well over a year for him to do that. And at another meeting, at the meeting of the task force, the federal one that met in September, I think it was, I went up to the governor and told him, 
Well, we finally brought you kicking and screaming to this issue, and he was mad. He said, I forward thinking on this. It was my initiative. So, you know. Yeah, the, the governor and his family are climate change deniers. Absolutely. Uh, from the get-go, starting with the dad, it's a real problem. Yeah. You know, in, in contrast, um, I'm endorsed by 350.org, Sierra Club, Sunrise I've got, got a list here. Yeah. Uh, New yeah, Hampshire, I, can you, I read that list now here? Sure, go ahead. Um, New Hampshire Progressive Coalition, Blue America, the grandson of Granny D, Doris Haddock, Rights and Democracy, New Hampshire, New Hampshire Youth Movement Action, New Hampshire Youth Climate Strike, 350 New Hampshire Action and 350 Action, New Hampshire Postal Workers Union, Sierra Club, Ben Cohen and Jerry Greenfield of Ben and Jerry's, Sunrise Dartmouth, Sunrise Keene, and Bernie Sanders. So it's a very it's a good list. I'm very proud of it. And and Ben and Jerry have named an ice cream after me because of my <laughs> positions on campaign finance. It's called Valinsky's Courageous Crunch. Oh, I was going to say Valinsky Crunch. <laughs> and, and it's uh, it's vanilla ice cream with a little cinnamon hearts. Oh. And because it's campaign finance, busted up million dollar chocolate bars. <laughs> they're, they're creative. <laughs> On a more somber note, um, has the coronavirus pandemic made you think about community any differently than you did before the pandemic? And if so, how? Oh, God. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, in, in many ways, the pandemic has really underscored how frayed our safety net is. Um, you know, we campaign by phone and by Zoom and occasionally uh, with videotaping like this. Um, I hear people who are worried about their next meals. They're worried about how they're going to stay in their homes. Um, they're worried about their children's health and safety and education. Um, it's hard to say to a parent or a child in high school to say you're essentially going to take a pause for a year. Um, you're not moving forward in the way you would like. Um, and a lot of those folks that I'm talking to who are worried about themselves always give me a story about their neighbor. Mm -hmm. um, and so in many ways pan the pandemics isolated us but in other ways, it's connected us because there are common themes, common problems that as a community, uh, we really do need, a, need to address and we need leadership to bring us together to address those really significant problems. Sort of following along on that theme, uh, during your campaign travels around the state, have you met any families or individuals that, that have had a significant effect on you and are there any stories you can share? Yeah, so most of the travels are virtual, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's phone and computer. Yeah. Um, but I, actually, I was talking to someone last Saturday who lived in a half million dollar house in Holderness, big, big house, uh, sold her house and moved to a little home in Keene because she'd gotten older, $150,000 house in town in Keene. Her property taxes went up by 20%. You can't make this stuff up. It's right. just so ridiculous. Um, so there's that kind of story that I've heard. Um, I've heard the story of the teacher who's also a parent trying to manage her remote classroom activities while she's also managing her own children's education with young children and that requires a lot of specific attention. I've heard from lots of teachers, um, some who are older and more experienced and may have some health issues of their own about how worried they are about going back into a classroom. I've heard, I've heard um, indeed my son's a middle school science teacher uh, with a nine week old and a two and a half year old uh, worried about going back into class for fear that he'll bring something home. Yeah. Um, so I, I've heard a lot about that. Um, 
I'm friends with the uh, executive director of the New Hampshire Food Bank. Uh, early on, um, she told me that the food bank can get food and increase its capacity, but it needed to raise money. And so campaigns have money-raising resources, mm -hmm. our emails, our social media. Uh, so we devoted those to raising money, not for us, but for the food bank. Um, and then we did the same thing. Some people will appreciate this on April 20th, on 420. Uh, we did the same thing for marijuana legalization. Uh, we featured a, a group that's responsible both for marijuana reform in terms of laws, but also in terms of criminal justice and expungements and uh, helping offenders to get back on their feet, uh, a place called The Last Prisoner Project. So we featured them. Um, I think there's some good that can come from campaigns. It's not just about me. And we have a responsibility to use those resources to help our respective communities. And I'm proud to have done that with my campaign. Wonderful. Um, speaking of campaigns, you're in the Democratic primary against Senator Dan Feltis. And if you move forward from there, you'll face Chris Sununu in the general election in November. What are the major differences between you and your opponents in this governor's race, both primary and the f final election? So uh, in the primary, uh, Senator Feltis and I are both Democrats. There's more that unites us than separates us. But you can think about the differences between Dan and me in terms of the three Ps. Uh, Dan's taken the pledge, which is a promise to fail. I refuse to take the pledge, first P. Second P is the pipeline. Dan supports fracking uh, and supports the Granite Bridge pipeline. I am steadfastly against the Granite Bridge pipeline. So that's the second P. The third P is how we pay for our campaigns. My campaign smashed the record on the number of contributors to our campaign, more at this point in the primary than any governor has ever done through the full cycle. I'm very proud of that. That's very intentional. And we don't take corporate PAC money. Uh, we've never exploited the LLC loophole. As I mentioned, we don't take fossil fuel money. Um, Dan ran an ad saying he didn't take corporate PAC money and never exploited the LLC loophole when he was doing both and got caught. There's an NHPR story about it, and he had to give back more than $10,000. Now, he can make one decision or the other, but you can't make the wrong decision and claim you did the right thing. Um, and so the differences between Sununu and me are night and day. Um, you know, my, my dad wasn't a governor. Uh, my dad was a mechanic and a maintenance man. Um, and I've had a lot of help along the way, um, but I come from a very different place than Chris Sununu does, and it shows. I watch as he performs his role of governor, and I'm working as an executive counselor. He often doesn't know what the contracts say that he brings before us. He nominates people who are unqualified for their jobs in state government because of political reasons. Um, we are very different people. How do you think uh, the governor has failed in his advocacy for New Hampshire with the federal government? Um, so the governor is, is very good at advocating with Pence and Trump. Uh, unfortunately, that's the most misguided place to go for advice um, on how to run a state. And so it takes us 180 degrees in the wrong direction. Um, and then I hear him time and time again um, dismissing the hard work of our elected federal representatives because they're Democrats. Uh, he gives them no credit for anything, ignoring the fact that we wouldn't have $1.25 billion in CARES Act relief money if Senator Shaheen, Senator Hassan, Congresswoman Custer, and Congressman Pappas weren't working hard for us. Um, so he'll listen to Pence and Trump and follow their lead and Betsy DeVos uh, and ignore the people who are really working in our favor. Um, I, I can't get over how 
misguided his efforts are. Do you also have a problem with the lack of transparency in the creation of the group that's oh. supposedly handling this uh, COVID money? Um, I have so much of a problem that I organized an effort on the council not to let Sununu take any money out of the treasury until he detailed where the money was going. And I'm happy to say from this area, Russ Prescott joined me. Nice. So four of us voted no money comes out of the treasury until you tell us. And then by the next meeting, Sununu came forward with 250 pages of documents. Some of that is how we know that he's awarded these sweetheart insider deal contracts to his political affiliates. That's how we know about it, because we stopped him from taking money out and spending it on our state. Wow. I thought there was more to the, than, than, you, than the eye saw in that whole issue, so yeah, read about it. Um, sounds like you've learned a lot in your terms with executive counselor. So w what have you learned in two terms as an executive counselor that you will bring with you into the governor's office if New Hampshire voters send you to the, the office there? I've really learned that the governor has three really important tools. Um, and then has to rely on others for the rest. Um, so the, the governor has the bully pulpit. He or she can speak out on important issues and the public and the press pays attention. And you can use that power for good to move the entire state forward, to bring people together or you could do what Chris Sununu does and favor the insiders and the business interests to the exclusion of everyone else. So I've seen the power there. I've seen him abuse it or ignore it. So that's number one. Number two, the governor sets the agenda for state government by who he nominates for important positions. As a leader on the executive council, I can stop really bad things from happening like his nomination of an anti-choice Supreme Court justice, like his nomination of three different climate change deniers to state posts. I can stop that, but I can't force him to nominate good people. And if I were governor, you would have people equipped to do the jobs that they're nominated for, people who represent the best interests of our state, um, I would be broadly informed by legitimate interest groups around our state. There would be racial diversity in my nominations. All of that would be very different than Sununu. And because the governor doesn't have a lot of direct power, the governor really has to act as collaborator in chief. And so with the council, the governor should be talking with us, getting advice, doesn't always have to accept it. but. What do you think about this? Who are the people from your part of the state that would best do this job? This governor has never asked for the advice of any Democrat on the council. And when he asks for advice of the Republicans, he does it in secret. So it's not even public what they're sharing. Uh, that is not how I would operate what should be New Hampshire's board of directors. Yes, indeed. And well, I'd lose a veto pen. Yeah, yeah. You know, maybe I'd, <laughs> I'd buy How many, a... 56? How many has he done? 60-something. Uh, 60-something. Yeah. Oh, so I'd have a cheap one that wouldn't have a lot of ink in it, <laughs> and I would reserve it for just the most egregious kinds of legislation, but I would not govern by veto. Well, you may have already mentioned one of the three things, but I'm going to ask you, what are the three most important things you do for New Hampshire if you become our governor, and I certainly hope you do. Well, thank you. So um, I would use the tools of bully pulpit yeah. and collaboration and setting the agenda for the state's budget so that it supports working people, people in struggling towns, supports our school systems because that's an investment in our future, supports infrastructure like roads and bridges 
because when you spend money there, it returns to your local community in a big way. I would invest in um, health care, both physical and mental health, because we've let both go. Um, we need a lot of work on uh, responding to the opioid crisis still, uh, and a lot of that relates to how we reimburse our providers. So I'd spend time there. Uh, and then the environment we've, we've talked about. Great. Do you have uh, any more thoughts or ideas that you'd like to share with New Hampshire's residents, Exeter's residents, and others? Yeah. Um, I, I would end with this. Um, income inequality in our state is a big problem. Um, we're fifth in the nation per capita, um, but we have a lot of people who are being left behind, and many more during this COVID crisis. Uh, the property tax is an unrelenting second mortgage that always goes up and you can never pay off. We need to stop downshifting. We need to deal with income inequality. Uh, I would sign a bill for a $15 an hour minimum wage. I would work to get better access to health care. I used to be on the board of the Manchester Community Health Center. I learned a lot by working at that poverty uh, medical organization that can form the backbone uh, for medical care throughout New Hampshire. There's a lot of work to be done, but we have a lot going for us. I don't want to overlook that. Uh, Amy and I chose to live here uh, 38 years ago because it's such a beautiful place. It's a place we wanted to live, and we raised our three kids here. But like many young adults, they went away to college and never came back. And so we need to deal with the problem of highest in the nation college tuition, highest in the nation student debt, um, school systems that have the lowest in the nation state investment. Those are things that you can deal with by having your budget priorities be consistent with your values. That's how I would govern the state. I hope you'll consider voting for me in the September 8th primary. Uh, I hope you'll vote absentee because it'll be safer, and then we go take on Chris Sununu in the fall. Everyone be safe out there. Take good care. Herb, this has been great. I really appreciate this opportunity. Well, I really appreciate uh, your, your great outlook for our state, and uh, how about a virtual fist bump? You got it, man. Thank you. Take good care. All right. Bye-bye.